Hello, my name is Douglas Kilmer, and I'm president of the United States National Committee of the International Council of Monuments and Sites. I want to welcome you to this webinar, should be an amazing one, entitled Stories of Self-Liberation Across the Americas. Now, this webinar is part of our ongoing collaboration with the United States National Park Service's Underground Railroad Network to Freedom in concert with Diane Miller, the National Program Manager for that program. In 2021, we at the United States National Committee of ICOMOS began our efforts to extend the program to other countries in the Americas. During the horrific era of slavery in the Americas, from 12 to 16 million human beings were brought from Africa to what was thought of then as the new world. Now, of course, it was only new to the Europeans who began to arrive in large numbers about 500 years ago. Upon their arrival, they encountered an enormous human population and very sophisticated cultures. As part of the process of colonization, many millions of indigenous people died from European diseases and because of the imposition of European land use practices. As time went on, people from Africa were brought to the Americas in chains to accelerate the process of colonialism. Now, while many of us are familiar with stories of self-liberation from the Southern United States, there's much more to the story. Most of the people brought to the Americas arrived in locations that are now in other countries. So today, we will hear stories of self-liberation from a number of those countries, including Brazil, the Dutch West Indies, Mexico, and Canada. Now, we're very grateful to our ICOMOS in Canada, who last year made the Underground Railroad Network a truly international one by participating in a ceremony to mark our collaboration. We now seek to widen that effort. It is of perhaps special interest that self-liberation by the peoples from Africa sometimes merged with the efforts of indigenous peoples to escape the yoke of colonialism. You won't hear about that. And with that, I would like to introduce Diane Miller, National Program Manager for the National Park Service's Underground Railroad Network to Freedom. Thank you. So the National Park Service has the National Underground Railroad Network to Freedom Program, which was legislated by Congress and signed by President Bill Clinton in 1998. This directs the National Park Service to do three things, to educate the public, to provide technical assistance, and to create a network of historic sites, interpretive and educational programs, and research facilities that have a verifiable association to the Underground Railroad. The legislation also tasked us to develop a unique logo that would serve as a visual representation of these members of the network. So the Network to Freedom seeks to illuminate the journey of those who self-liberated by recognizing their escape, their journey, and how they created a new life in freedom, as well as those who provided assistance. In the National Park Service Underground Railroad Network to Freedom, we define the Underground Railroad as resistance to enslavement through escape and flight. That includes self-liberated people, enslaved people who self-liberated, as well as those who assisted them in their efforts to escape. But to be very clear, without freedom seekers, without self-liberating enslaved people, there would be no Underground Railroad. As we've been working in this program for 20 years, we've um, come to some new understandings about the Underground Railroad from what we learned as children in, in school. First off, it is a resistance movement. It focuses around African-American agency, both enslaved people and black communities and churches. It's based on the fact of escaped, not whether anyone was particularly successful. If they escaped, it's still Underground Railroad. And it did not begin in the 1830s when trains became popular. As soon as people were enslaved, as soon as Africans were enslaved from the colonial period 
in the US through the end of 1865, there were people self-liberating. The Underground Railroad evolved over time and place. And sometimes in some places it was very purposeful with networks of activists. It operated as a web, as a network with uh, cells of activists working together. The Underground Railroad was not just people escaping to Canada. It was enslaved people going south, going west, wherever they could find freedom. And it moved westward as the US expanded and slavery moved westward. So the map on the right <laughs> with the red X through it is map of how we used to see the Underground Railroad. The map on the left is um, reflecting sites and programs that we have in the Underground Railroad Network to Freedom. And we know this map really should include much more of the world, much further throughout the Americas, indeed even to the Pacific and elsewhere. We know that people escaped the US and went to other countries to seek their freedom. Um, a few of those places, Buxton, Canada, we'll be hearing from, Nacimiento, Mexico, um, where Black Se Seminole settled. Black Seminoles settled also in the Bahamas on Andros Island. Uh, we know there's much, much more to the story, and that's why we're excited to be able to uh, speak with everybody today. Um, so as we've been doing this in the U.S. for 20 years, we have identified 733 members across 39 US states, DC and the Virgin Islands, even Hawaii is uh, represented in the network. Um, one of the things we do in addition to um, recognizing and documenting underground railroad sites is we work to preserve them. So this is the same building, the pictures on the top are the before pictures, and the pictures are the, on the bottom are some 20 years later after uh, they've done a lot of work locally and the Network to Freedom has been able to uh, support their efforts. So we're very anxious to uh, share with everybody here and others as this project moves forward. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Jane Landers. I'm the Gertrude Conaway Vanderbilt Professor of History at Vanderbilt, and also I'm the US member of the UNESCO Route of Enslaved Peoples. I'm very pleased to be able to work with ECOMOS and the National Park Service with whom I've worked uh, long in the past. And in fact, our, one of the sites that I'll show you about today is listed with them. Um, I'm a Latin Americanist by training, but uh, as Diane just alluded to, half of the country of the United States as we know it today from Florida to California was once part of Spanish territory. And so Spanish law, politics, religion, and so on was all based on a quite different system than um, we might be used to in thinking about slavery today in the United States and self-liberation. So uh, one of the things that I always mention to people when we're talking is uh, American slavery and African-American history in general did not be begin in Jamestown in 1619, but in these much earlier places. And one of the keys to, um, to people achieving freedom under the Spanish system was their baptism into the Catholic faith, uh, an image from the 13th century showing a baptism of an African man is part of that storyline. And the other part is that not all Africans were enslaved. Many helped others get to freedom. Many were free quite a long while. And uh, and matter of fact, many of our um, earliest explorers included Africans among their uh, populations of exploration. And so we have some very important early 16th century figures. Uh, Juan Garrido is the most famous, who was accompanying uh, Cortez on his expeditions through all of the Southeast on eventually to uh, Mexico. The oldest uh, settlement that we had of Spaniards was in St. Augustine, Florida, and it also included enslaved and free people of African descent including people like this translator from the early uh, or the mid 16th century who had shipwrecked on the coast of Florida and became an important translator of indigenous languages for the Spaniards and became free, has a military record that we can track. Another free African man 
uh, of African descent and European descent, who was part of the Spanish militia and also uh, a store owner of some repute in St. Augustine. Um, enslaved people also became convicts and were exiled to Florida from Cuba usually. Uh, and this is a gentleman who we found who became free as a result of his uh, valuable service as an um, um, ironsmith, I'm trying to say in English. We also find women enslaved and free who had made it to St. Augustine. Why were they coming to St. Augustine to uh, achieve this freedom? Because of that religious sanctuary policy that I mentioned before. Uh, runaway slaves from the English colonies north of Florida began running as early as 1687 as the first example I can find. And eventually the Spanish crown makes a decision that will grant everybody who leaves a Protestant colony freedom in the Spanish world if they will convert to Catholicism. And that policy goes all across the Caribbean and anywhere in Latin America after 1693. And so more and more people kept running from South Carolina and Georgia into Spanish Florida, where they eventually presented themselves to the government at St. Augustine, were documented and received freedom. They received land. They became um, militiamen, as I mentioned. And uh, we did a, a wonderful museum exhibit some years ago and some publications about the town they began. Gracia Real de Santa Teresa de Mose was the first free black town in what is today the United States, established in 1738. And its owner or captain was Francisco Menendez once he was baptized into the Catholic Church. Um, and I'm tracking him now for a documentary. But these are the people that uh, actually started that colony and helped get that freedom uh, available to people. As I mentioned, this policy then will spread through the Caribbean, but it will also spread from Florida to California. And so you'll be hearing about some of the speakers today about the runaways who followed these earlier runaways and left Protestant uh, Texas to run into Catholic Mexico and become free there. So the policy uh, begins quite early in other parts of the Caribbean, but in the United States, at least it begins in 1693. And um, those who didn't run to the Spaniards to achieve their freedom ran uh, to maroon communities across the United States as well. So the Savannah Swamps, the Florida Everglades, uh, they became allies of the Yamasee War in 1715. They become Black Seminoles, and I track all of those folks as well. And you'll hear about others in uh, across the country. So I think that's enough from me. And um, now I would like to introduce uh, the next speaker, and this is uh, this is Ana Dunya Maria Verwe, who is now the curator at the Gilvink. I'm sorry for the mispronunciation, Hinlopen House Foundation and Museum in Amsterdam, and she's been a curator of many wonderful exhibits. Uh, she'll speak to us today about what is currently going on at her museum. Yes, hello, hello everybody from the Netherlands, from Geelvink Museum. <laughs> yeah, the request from Ecomos US to Ecomos Netherlands to present a contribution on the memory of the times of slavery and self-emancipation in Suriname, a former Dutch colony, very neatly coincided with a project we plan to present for the celebration of 2023, the de facto celebration of 150 years abolition from slavery in the Dutch West Indian colonies in Suriname and the Caribbean islands. In um, 2013, now nine years ago, we already celebrated the declaration of the abolition of slavery in 1853, but that was an abolition only on paper. The enslaved people had to work still for another 10 years on the plantations as a sort of compensation for the plantation owners. Only on 1st of July, 1863, so next year, 150 years ago, will be the official abolition of slavery commemoration 
and we plan to present a special project which we think is a very telling example of the vitality of the traditions of the former enslaved people, the fugitives of the plantations in Suriname during colonial times from the mid 17th century till 1863 and beyond. Living heritage still very vital till today in Suriname as well as in the diaspora. And this is the tradition of singing songs and storytelling, always very strong in the Maron communities in Suriname. The Maron communities are a very specific characteristic of Suriname population with self-liberation from slavery as their shared history. They are the second biggest community in nowadays Suriname, consisting of five or six language groups with roots already in the earliest stages of the plantation economy, which rested on the exploitation of human labor. The enslaved people forced to work on the plantations under extreme harsh conditions, mainly the sugar and coffee plantations. From the early start around 1660, there were runaways from the plantations who settled in the bush on inaccessible areas as small, independent and self-sustaining communities with their own structures like the graman or capitain on top and developing their own language and traditions. I was expecting here a picture of two Gramans, but I don't see them now. Yeah, well, <laughs> anyway, um, in the long run of time, the runaways became a threatening force to the colonial power and the plantation owners, resulting in several military clashes like the Bush Wars in the 18th century, culminating in a treaty with the Dutch government in 1760, which formulated certain rights, but also conditions the duty to send back new runaways to their original plantations, which resulted again in new bush wars and military expeditions against the Marons. Now, uh, Colonel Stedman was a Scottish officer in Dutch military service, and he recorded his experiences in his narrative of a five years expedition against the revolted Negroes of Suriname in 1796. You will see a, a picture of Setma. Yes, here he is uh, standing on a, fugitive, a fugitive Maron. And next to that is a Maron who is cautious on his way out uh, with his weapon. Back to our project. Music, singing songs and storytelling were a part of the activities for all sorts of occasions, celebrations, festive and solemn, spiritual gatherings for worshipping, for entertainment and playing. Children's songs are part of these traditions. What is the function of songs? Songs can have an important function of keeping the spirit of freedom high, a moral support in times of hardship, and keeping also the memory alive, empowering the younger generation. One of these of us of such songs, which embodies all of these elements, is the famous, very popular song, Biggie Kaiman big alligator remembered by the old and still sung among the youngest generation and it already resulted in a recently in 2022 published children book you can see it on the back of biggie guy mom i see it also as a token of the vitality of this tradition of songs and storytelling from slavery times. 
um, we have this song Biggie Kaiman. The singer is said a half a tone. For time reasons, I have to stop. Um, well, uh, you saw already um, uh, Gerda Havertong and Ronald Snijders. Um, and the this song is one of the songs that we plan to uh, record uh, for a medium like a video podcast with famous Surinamese singer and actress Gerda Havertong and flutist and composer Ronald Snijders. Here you see them both on uh, the picture for this for 2023. Now, what is Biggie Kaiman about? The song refers to the story of self-liberation starting already in the early 18th century of a Maron community from a sugar plantation located within the square between the Suriname River and the Komowijne River and Brokopondo Lake, you see there the lake and Zanderij, which is now the uh, Surinamese airport. They took refuge to the bush behind the plantation which gave them the name Bakabushi Nengre, back of the bush Nengre, and near a swampy area called Kaiman Grassi. Um, the legend goes back to a historic episode. It says that the runaways were helped by a big Kaiman, a huge alligator with grass on his head and back so that the fugitives could step on him and be brought unseen through the swamps to safer grounds, Kaiman Grassi. The members of this special community were later mid 19th century called the Bros Campers, after their leader Bros, of whom a unique photo exists. I hope this photo comes back because it is the only a surviving photo of a Maron freedom fighter taken in the city of Paramaribo on the occasion of a peace treaty with the Dutch governor general. Yes, there he is. So this is Capitain Broos, and this picture dates from 1862 when he signed a peace treaty with the colonial government. He lived with his family in the swampy area of Kaiman Grassi. Brood was the Bros was head of uh, the Bros Campers or Bakabusi Nengre. The Bros Campers defeated the military exhibition sent by the colonial authority in 1862 to destroy this Maron community. And also about this bloody battle, a song exists. In, after abolition of slavery in 1863, Bros and family came to live as free people at the plantation Rorak near Kaiman Grassi. To end my presentation on songs and tales from slavery times, in which I, sorry, <laughs> mainly touched on songs, less on tales, I would like to share with you a video recording in which you can see the vitality of this living heritage. Gedda, sings old Surinamese children's songs with elderly people with dementia. In newly, in February 2020, opened Alzheimer Daycare Center in Paramaribo. Vishe. So now we will see, I hope, in sound. I hope sound will come as well. Rose, 
Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. That was a fascinating presentation. Uh, I would like to hear more about it and I will follow up on some of your wonderful work. I'd also like now to present to you uh, Professor Rafael Sanzio Araujo dos Anjos, who is a full professor and geographer and cartographer at the Universidade de Brasilia. He's a graduate of the Universidade Federal de Bahia and he's the author of many wonderful projects and publications specifically on the geopolitics and cartography of Afro-Brazilian communities, including maroon communities, and maps that I will now begin to use in my own classes since I have been introduced to his wonderful work. So, Professor Rafael. Estão me ouvindo? Boa tarde a todos. Está ouvindo, Júnior? Bem? Sim. Ok, boa tarde a todos, a todas. É um prazer grandioso estar aqui, uma palavra inicial de agradecimento né, à senhora Gaia, diretora da Secretaria Internacional do Icomos em Paris, e ao senhor Douglas e sua equipe maravilhosa aqui sustentando esse evento, é, presidente do Icomos aqui nos Estados Unidos. Nós vamos falar do Brasil africano e, particularmente, dos quilombos, primeiros territórios de resistência e libertação do novo mundo. E aí, lógico, nós precisamos ir é a diáspora, não tem como, todos os meus colegas que antecederam aqui vai na diáspora para explicar o agora, para explicar o hoje. Né? Então, a partir do século XV, nós temos, sem dúvida nenhuma, esse grande triângulo, Europa moderna, continente africano e o novo mundo, a América, onde a África era o epicentro, né? o epicentro do enriquecimento do, desse momento do, do mundo que vai se prolongar por cinco séculos. Né? O Brasil vai ter um destaque especial nesse processo, né, o Brasil vai ter as maiores estatísticas. E é, essas estatísticas vão marcar decisivamente o papel do Brasil nesse novo desenho que vai se configurar no novo mundo. Né? É, o Brasil vai implementar com sucesso, ao longo desse processo, um escravismo que a gente vai chamar de escravismo industrial. Essa fotografia, por exemplo, mostra o que é homens, é, mulheres, crianças, idosos, idosos, enfim, todos os estratos de ser humano aparecem aí trabalhando para produzir, pro, pela, enfim, para a produção colonial, que o Brasil vai ter um destaque nesse momento da geopolítica global, como disse, vai se prolongar. Esse case, esse carimbo da produção do açúcar do ouro branco começa lá na ilha de São Tomé, no Golfo da Guiné. E junto com esse, essa tecnologia que vai se implementar bem na Bahia e em Pernambuco, vem os quilombos. Então, os quilombos vão ser implementados no Brasil no início do século XVI. Então, os quilombos são o quê? Um, um processo fundamental é, para se... É, para revelar os conflitos, os ruídos do sistema escravocrata. Essa cartografia que mostra os quilombos ancestrais mostra muito, em uma certa precisão que os quilombos estavam espalhados em todo o território. E eu consigo ver também nos estados do agora, no Brasil contemporâneo, onde esses quilombos ancestrais estão, porque ajudam nas pesquisas arqueológicas. Né? Toda a formação territorial do Brasil tem de fundo o sistema escravista. E isso é algo muito importante a gente colocar, porque esse, esse Brasil do agora tem que sempre conversar com o Brasil ancestral para poder ele entender é, as suas perspectivas, sobretudo de governança e de solução. É, existem sete constituições no Brasil, e dessas sete constituições, apenas na última, as constituições anteriores têm conteúdos eugênicos, 
A Constituição atual de 1988, fim do século XX, portanto, é a única que a palavra quilombo aparece. Então, a palavra quilombo aparece ela é apenas no documento oficial mais importante do país há poucas décadas. Né? E aí a gente tem que olhar por que o Brasil vive tanto esse racismo estrutural e institucional e onde os quilombos são profundamente acometidos. O Brasil vive uma certa miopia, que é o que uma dificuldade de enxergar a riqueza, a potencialidade que estão nos territórios tradicionais de matriz africana no Brasil. E são seis os pilares que balizam essa resistência brasileira. Primeiro, não olhar para a diáspora, não olhar para a historiografia, a historiografia do passado de maneira mais clara, de maneira mais decente. Segundo, é, o, a, como a nossa população é mensurada, então nós vivemos um dilema de uma pardalização, que é um processo secular, é uma política de Estado. Um terceiro ponto, a desigualdade. O Brasil é um país muito desigual. Não tem como. Qualquer imagem do Brasil tem riqueza e pobreza sempre convivendo. Um outro ponto, a política. Não temos representações na política. E aí, com isso, seja no Senado, seja na Câmara, isso é um fato que compromete decisivamente os territórios tradicionais e os quilombos. Um outro ponto, o Estado policial. Nós vivemos uma nação que tem um projeto claro de extermínio das populações negras, das periferias, das grandes cidades, onde muitos quilombos também estão. Então, esses são pontos importantes para a gente olhar os territórios quilombolas do Brasil que é a grande expressão espacial, é a grande expressão demográfica, é a grande expressão de manutenção das tradições, dos saberes, dos conhecimentos dos povos africanos desde o século XVI até o momento atual no Brasil. São mais de 6 mil territórios pulverizados em toda a nação. Então, essa cartografia dá essa dimensão espacial de um, dos territórios quilombolas, e aqui a gente dá um zoom é como pegar uma lente, olhar de mais perto e ver isso aqui. Nesse território de Dona Lió, no Brasil Central, no grande território Calunga, nós temos o quê? Dona Lió tem o quê? Produz sua carne, produz o seu bolo, ela tem onde assar, ela tem onde estocar a farinha, ela tem um pilão sagrado para manter a comida que nunca falta. Ou seja, por que o Brasil ainda tem tantos quilômetros contemporâneos? Porque o Brasil, é, mesmo com as dificuldades é, da, do policiamento, da violência, do, da agressão às suas leis, ao seu amparo. O Brasil guarda o conhecimento da sobrevivência nos territórios quilombolas. Então, é, temos que olhar esses elementos, mas temos que olhar também perspectiva de alteração desse quadro no nação. E aí nós temos três premissas básicas, que é o seguinte, aonde houver grandes regiões geoeconômicas de produção, é, de produção para enriquecimento do império e depois da nação, tem quilombo contemporâneo. Essa estatística nos diz o seguinte, que o Brasil enriqueceu, tem um Brasil rico atual que precisa considerar esses quilombos. E aí a gente parte para a segunda premissa, que é o quê? A economia da escravidão. Os grandes estados brasileiros que se enriqueceram também com o sistema escravocrata, eles merecem auxiliar de forma mais focada nas políticas reparatórias, seja ela pública, seja ela privada, para os quilombos do Brasil. Um terceiro ponto tem a ver com o quê? Com olhar a demografia. Né? Esse Brasil, há 150 anos atrás, foi feito o primeiro censo no Brasil. E esse censo mostrou o quê? Que 70% da população que tinha no Brasil naquele momento era o quê? Era de africanos, africanas e seus descendentes. Então, a gente percebe que, hoje, no Brasil do agora, esses estados que têm o maior contingente de população afro-brasileira, um deles um, são quilombolas, merece também uma atenção especial. Se eu junto esses fatores e olho para o quadro de leis que já tem no Brasil, são três principais. A Fundação Cultural Palmares, que tem um conjunto de quilombos que são mais reconhecidos. Eu olho para o 20 de novembro, que é um feriado que ainda a nação toda não para, mas deve parar, para refletir sobre a importância dos quilombos para o Brasil existir como ele é. E depois, o Estatuto da Igualdade Racial, que nos dá a possibilidade para olhar para esse selo quilombola e ser algo que possa ser implementado em toda a nação, nos 6 mil territórios. Esse programa Brasil Quilombola, que foi um projeto de governo, pode ser um projeto de Estado. E aí, com isso, a cartografia oficial do país pode contemplar o quê? Quilombos. Esse é um mapa feito pelo Instituto Brasileiro de Geografia e Estatística do Brasil. E o IBGE não tem uma cartografia ainda quilombola, vai ter no futuro, e que valorize também o quê? os produtos. 
Se eu valorizo os produtos, a economia que não bola entra oficialmente no país e aí a gente consegue manter o quê? Um processo de implementação de uma política de Estado que não bola, onde tem reparação, onde tem reabilitação, onde tem respeito. E aí a gente pode ver o quê? Que os dois Brasis, o Brasil do passado e o Brasil atual, extremamente africano, em qualquer lugar do Brasil, que nós fomos, a matriz africana está presente. Que esses dois Brasis precisam ter mais resiliência e para que os quilombos se insiram de forma honrosa, de forma decente, é necessário que o Brasil africano é, olhe para o Brasil e insira ele no sistema. Ou seja, o Brasil africano seja olhado. Que o Brasil africano seja honrado. Ou seja, que a gente respeite a ancestralidade. E que o Brasil africano tenha lugar, ele tenha território. Nós estamos aqui, eu e meus antepassados, há cinco séculos, os territórios ainda não existem, são sempre em conflito. É isso. Muito obrigado pela atenção. Estou passando a você, Jane, a palavra mais uma vez. É isso. Thank you very much, Professor. That was a wonderful presentation, and I would love to see your PowerPoint. I will certainly look at your project that you uh, gave us the, the sign for. That's wonderful, too. Um, and next, we're going to hear from Professor Maria Esther Hammack, who is currently a post uh, a Barra postdoctoral fellow at the McNeil Center at the University of Pennsylvania. She graduated from the University of Texas, uh, and I was pleased to serve on her doctoral committee. She's done some wonderful work on self-liberation across from the Texas border across to Mexico. Uh, her project is entitled Channels of Liberation, Freedom Fighters and Black Movement Across a Global Frontier, Mexico, the United States and beyond, 1790 to 1868. Thank you, Dr. Landers, for that wonderful uh, introduction. And thank you to Lydia and ICOMOS for uh, hosting all of us today. And so um, I'm excited to share some of the work that I've been doing with all of you. I will tell you a little bit about um, the, my work and share a few stories of liberation um, that I have traced within Mexican spaces. Uh, I study Black liberation, particularly in North America, and the goal of the work that I do is to reconsider the histories of freedom making, freedom claiming, and freedom fighting. So in other words, I am interested in learning about how freedom was produced or crafted and who did that crafting. Um, I'm also interested in how freedom was claimed and fought for and who the actors were um, of who the actors were that were central to the shaping of these histories that connect uh, North America, particularly you know, US, Mexico, and, and uh, Canada. For the context, uh, for instance, for the US context, because I am a US historian, uh, my work highlights the importance of reconsidering the Underground Railroad beyond the scopes of what uh, it represents today, or rather how it has long been represented and understood. Um, for, for many, many years. And I stress in the work that I do, the importance of reconsidering um, this Underground Railroad because this metaphor uh, did not actually exist before 1839. It was in 1839 that the term was first used in a Washington DC newspaper where um, the, the story centered an enslaved person who was quoted uh, saying that he hoped to escape on a railroad that went underground. And it is still not clear, and I've been doing some more research on this, but it's not clear who this person was or if this was a story that was merely anecdotal. So uh, it's still not clear. There's, there's other uh, origin stories for the, for the metaphor that um, I also highlight in my work. But my goal, it really is to help broaden the geographies, the actors and the, time, and, and the timelines of black liberation in North America. For the Mexico context, my work examines the stories of what I call the second diaspora of black liberation that shaped Mexico. A diaspora that I argue, that I argue began in the late 18th century and you know, continued through the 19th century. And these stories are the stories of liberation of people held enslaved across US spaces or, or spaces that were quickly transforming into US spaces. 
uh, particularly in the late 18th century, early 19th. And um, of these individuals who left those geographies, ventured across uh, spaces, these shared borderlines between those early American spaces and early Mexican spaces to claim freedom. And the goal of this work um, is to showcase um, how people not only navigated journeys to freedom southward, but how they claimed freedom, how they fought for it, and how they secured it in Mexican spaces. So I wanted to share this brief timeline highlighting some of the important, not all of them, but some of the important anti-slavery legislation produced within Mexico or what I call early Mexico. Um, and this certainly is not comprehensive, but it gives you a glimpse of the precedents that propelled the knowledge and the ideas about freedom in Mexico or that or, or freedom possibilities in Mexico. And this knowledge and these ideas uh, were the same that were reaching people that were enslaved across US spaces. So people knew and understood that in Mexico, freedom could potentially be claimed. And I began in, in 1789, and, and I do build on the work of uh, Dr. Landers, as you know, she, she mentioned she was in my um, dissertation committee, but I do highlight this law that, was, um, that sets apart from the religious sanctuary laws that existed, that were um, offered by the Spanish crown for um, Spanish dominions, because this particular one did not have any religious connotations or requirements, but it did apply to early Mexican spaces, including this vast frontier that um, soon became you know, the Texas, Texas geographies. And so um, I wanted to show you this timeline just to give you context on that. And so uh, what I have been doing um, for my dissertation, but also for my first book project, is tracing how people um, held enslaved across US spaces made their way to Mexican ones. Um, and women, some of the um, highlights of the work that I do is that um, the archives that I have consulted highlights that women were at the forefront of these journeys southward or southeastward. So contrary to the historiography that tells us that women escape bondage less than men, uh, for the very various reasons that um, um, historians have highlighted, the records that I have found, particularly in Mexican archives, clearly show, uh, Mexican and US archives clearly show that um, women were uh, very active in um, journeying to freedom and claiming uh, liberation in Mexican, particularly early Mexican spaces. And so what I've learned is that when you find the women, you also find the children and the men and the families. And so that has been a, a really uh, rewarding aspect of the work that I've been doing. And so I have added a few documents in this slide for you to see uh, that center women in their pursuits of liberation to uh, early Mexican spaces. And that particular um, uh, report, for instance, was a, was a document reporting about the escape of a woman with her four-year-old son who had escaped Opelousas, Louisiana and a, a French enslaver at that time and had uh, ventured to claim freedom in San Antonio. And so these are some of the sources that I have uh, come across. And so I wanted to share some uh, of this with you. And I will return to women in a few uh, because I do have uh, a couple of stories that I wanted to highlight uh, for you. But I do want to talk about another aspect that is uh, also very important to the work that I do and that I have documented um, and in many ways interrogated through my work. And that is how journeys to freedom to Mexico materialized, uh, not only geographic, but um, intellectual and how individuals navigated uh, frontier spaces and borderlands and waterways to reach uh, Mexican spaces. And some of the questions that lead to this work is that I have asked myself is who led these journeys to Mexican spaces and who was part of these networks? And what I have found has been enlightening, but not surprising. The networks of assistance that I have documented are quite diverse and a pool of individuals and groups did a lot of the helping of these networks. Mexican people were certainly, for instance, known to assist both within Mexico and the US and sometimes Mexicans served as guides to help people across the river, across different rivers um, to reach Mexico or across the Gulf of Mexico to reach Mexico. At other times, there were local Mexicans who offered food and raised money to give people who arrived on Mexican soil, um, often with nothing, 
but a few clothes uh, that they were wearing. As this document in the middle highlights, uh, individuals do, did, um, local neighbors uh, in Mexico will help and raise money like that uh, document shows that they raised 246 pesos to give a, a group of individuals who had reached in Coahuila at that point. I've also documented native people who were known to be part of these networks of assistance um, and who participated in helping black people pursuing freedom or pursuing to reach freedom in Mexico. Some individuals and groups seeking to reach Mexico actually brokered networks in Comancherias during the early 1830s, where they could, um, if not to formally receive assistance, at least were offered safe passage as they were making their way to Mexico. Also, I have found that the Tawalash groups along the Red River in southern Texas were also known to assist people escaping to freedom. It is, however, very important to highlight um, that and acknowledge that Native groups also often enslave Black people trying to reach Mexico, as well as, um, you know, Mexicans, um, I have found in the records, Mexicans also worked as slave hunters, so keep this in mind. But nevertheless, uh, both Mexican and Native groups regularly were part of these networks of assistance, but importantly and very key to my work is that we were Black Americans enslaved and free who actually engineered what I call channels of liberation to Mexican spaces. They were leading the way, they were leading the pursuits, they were doing the fighting and, um, and claiming of freedom at the very many levels so that this freedom materialized, um, as well as um, you know, in these in this, uh, pursuits, many of them actually failed to secure their freedom, but nevertheless, their pursuits were very important. And so I wanted to conclude with the stories of two women, uh, and I'm sorry, I'm like, you know, very, very, very brief, uh, but if you would like to learn more, uh, let me know, uh, of two women who I find to be foundational to the stories of self-liberation self in Mexico. The first woman is a woman named Sylvia Hector, and her uh, story really brought my work full, full circle. One of the, the, the goals that I had when I began this, doing this work was to find the Harriet Tubman's or Harriet Tubman that led people to Mexican destinations. I was sitting in a class in North Carolina at East Carolina University where I did my undergraduate and I was learning about the history of the uh, Old South and um, I was learning about Harriet Tubman and um, I really wanted to know who led people to Mexico because I knew that Mexico had abolished slavery. So I asked my professor and he said, that's a great question. Please let me know if you find anything out. And so this led me to this work. And as I was doing the work for my dissertation, I came across Sylvia Hector and who was a woman who not only led people to Mexico or assisted people to Mexico across her ferry, but also um, moved herself to Mexico at the outbreak of the Civil War because um, to escape um, Confederate persecution. And so she, she moved all the way to Tamaulipas. And I was able to connect with her descendants and show them her uh, freedom papers who they have never actually seen. And so that is also part of the work that I do, connect individuals to those histories that perhaps they knew or perhaps they didn't, but also to the records. Uh, of individuals like Sylvia who haven't been uh, acknowledged or recognized as part of this movement. And so I wanted to conclude with the story of Elvia Green, who arrived in Veracruz, Mexico from Louisiana in the late summer of 1830. And upon her arrival, she claimed her freedom in Mexico under uh, some of the Mexican abolitionist laws. By January, of eight, by January of 1831, she had not only successfully claimed her liberation, but had settled in Coatzacoalcos, Veracruz, where she was recognized as, the, um, according to the records, keeping with honor and making a living as a seamstress as a, and as a laundress. Her petition is part of a record that highlights her, uh, her process of securing not only her freedom in Mexico, but her ability to live free and stay free in Veracruz. So she was seeking the security of naturalization papers in this, in this uh, document that I show right here in hopes to ensure that her stay in Mexico was not just, was not just uh, fleeting, but it was more permanent and officially sanctioned by the Mexican government. And so that is all I have for you. And thank you so much for being here. And I know this was very fast, but uh, I hope you enjoyed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria. That was wonderful. Um, I see so many similarities in, in many of these stories that we're hearing today. So we'll do some discussion afterwards. 
but now I'd like to introduce Shannon Prince, uh, also an old friend, who's a sixth generation descendant from the historic Canadian Elgin settlement and the Buxton Mission in Canada. It was a haven for fugitive slaves long before the American Civil War, as was Maria's Mexico. Uh, uh, Shannon is the curator of the Buxton National Historic Site and Museum and a member of several of the organizations in Canada and the U.S. that research and promote the North American story of slavery, uh, including freedom through the Underground Railroad and the American Civil War. Shannon? Buxton Settlers and Their Stories. Slavery in Canada was very much part of early Canadian history from the Maritimes to the coast of the Pacific. Records show that as early as 1501, a Portuguese explorer had enslaved 15, 50 native or Pawnee Canadian men and women. And the first documentation of a slave was in 1632. A Negro boy by the name of Oliver Lejeune is, captured, is brought from Madagascar over to New France, which is now our province of Quebec. And this is a slave ad um, offering a $25 reward for um, an, someone who was enslaved. Um, they were looking for him in the province of Nova Scotia. And this is a map of southwest and central Ontario, where some of the other different settlements and communities were established. And here we are, North Buxton. Um, and you can see our relationship with the um, Detroit border and up here, um, Niagara um, area as well. Niagara Falls, Niagara and the Lake, Buffalo, New York. And these are some of the other black communities that were established in southwest and central Ontario. Uh, London, uh, the Queen's Bush, which is Kitchener, Waterloo, Ontario today. Oakville, Toronto, Oro, Niagara-on-the-Lake, St. Catharines, Hamilton, Collingwood, and Owen Sound. And this is one of my favorite quotes. Buxton is certainly a very interesting place. 16 years ago, it was a wilderness. Now, good highways are laid out in all directions to the forest, and by their side are about 200 cottages, all looking neat and comfortable. Around each one is a cleared space, which is well cultivated. There are signs of industry and thrift and comfort everywhere. Signs of intemperance, of idleness, of want nowhere. Most interesting of all are the inhabitants. 20 years ago, most of them were slaves who owned nothing, not even their children. Now they own themselves. They own their houses and farms, and they have their wives and their children about them. They have the great essentials for human happiness, something to love, something to do and something to hope for. Samuel Gridley Howe, Boston, 1864. So he was a doctor and an abolitionist, excuse me, and he was the founder of an anti-slavery newspaper, the Boston Daily Commonwealth. And his wife was Julia Ward, who wrote um, the Hymn of the Republic, and who was also very involved in the suffrage movement and an abolitionist. And he was also commissioned by President Lincoln um, to go to various communities in Canada West to see where other Blacks were coming to um, have a the better of betterment of life. And this is what he wrote when he came to Buxton. And the Buxton Settlement was founded in 1849 by Reverend William King um, for his former slaves and other fugitive slaves and free Blacks. The settlement consisted of 9,000 acres, which was divided into 50 acre lots and sold to the settlers. The settlement grew to close to 2,000 people at one time. Um, there were a variety of different industries. There was a pearl ash, a potash factory, uh, a bank, um, a hotel, even though liquor was not allowed. Uh, there was a blacksmith and they even built a tramway down to um, the lake uh, uh, to transport barrel staves and heavy lumber for shipping. Uh, a, cough, a, sh a shoe shop, um, a brickyard. There were many industries that were here that were established and agriculture was one of the main um, industries that were here. And this is a photo that was taken in front of the school that we have here at the museum that was taken in 1910. And it's interesting because the education here was a pivotal point in the success of the settlement um, because it was an integrated school. 
Um, the first black Canadian doctor, Anderson Riffin Abbott, was educated at this school, as well Marcus Garvey's secretary was educated at that school. And these are also some of the different industries. Papa Prince's Pleasure Parlor, which was not uh, uh, something, uh, it doesn't sound like a place of ill repute at all. And this is an um, overview of the museum now. This is the school, the last school that was built in 1861 and opened until 1968. This is the oldest home in the settlement, uh, built in 1852, until and people lived there until 1986. And this is Abraham Dora Shad's barn, Marianne Shad Carey's dad. This is Isaac Riley, who was born in North Carolina, but raised in Perry County, Missouri. He escaped to Canada for a better life in 1848 and married Catherine in Amherstburg. Uh, he felt the people in Essex were cold and not friendly, so he moved to Michigan for better wages, but didn't really feel safe. So uh, they moved to St. Catharines, where life was much better than in Windsor. But then they moved to Buxton in 1849. Actually, he was waiting for Reverend King when he arrived here. So he had two sons, Jerome, who became a doctor, and John received a doctor of divinity. This is another favorite of my stories, Anne-Marie Weems. She was born in Maryland in 1840 to a free father, John, who had purchased his freedom and enslaved mother Arabella. They had 10 children and the master died in 1847 and his one evil daughter inherited the Weems. The daughter had a large debt, but John tried to raise money to buy his family back, but not enough. So the daughter sold them to the slave traders who put two of the daughters in a slave pen and the mother be sold further down south in Alabama. The girls were to be sold and a Ween's ransom fund was established. And it was interesting because there were local people that were trying to raise money, but also people in England, the Clifton Ladies Anti-Slavery Slavery Society were sending funds for this Ween's family. So there was a um, John located where one of his daughters was going to be sold and he had enough money to buy one. So he went to the auction and lo and behold, there are two of his daughters, Anne Marie and his sister. So as a parent, how do you decide which one to buy? So basically he bought the older one um, because he knew what was going to happen to her. And Arabella was quite, er, sorry, Anne Marie was young. But um, because she was so young and a valuable uh, commodity, if you will, the, mat, the mistress made her sleep on the floor. But there were several people who tried to help her escape. So long, uh, <laughs> they disguised her as a boy after different people helped her um, to put her disguise on. And she eventually made it up to Dresden and up this way disguised as a boy. So it's an incredible story. Uh, Pierre was born um, in 1837 in Alabama and he arrived in Buxton in 1856. He was educated at the Buxton Mission School, received his teaching degree from Toronto. So he became the first teacher, the black teacher at the school right here in 1861 and became the first black congressman in the state of Alabama. The Christiana Riots in Christiana, Pennsylvania. It was a violent encounter in 1851 and it occurred at the home of William Parker, who was an escaped slave. Slave owner Edward Gorsuch was from Maryland and he, he attempted to arrest four freedom seekers who were living at the Parker farm. When Gorsuch arrived, Eliza Parker, William's wife, went up to the attic, blew a horn, and summoned uh, neighbors and sympathetic neighbors and former slaves, as well as black and white abolitionists all around to come to the rescue. Edward Gorsuch was killed his, in the shootout and his son was wounded. Uh, William and Eliza fled en route to Canada. They were assisted by Frederick Douglass. Uh, Eliza is buried in our cemetery next to the school, um, the museum, and William is buried in Canton, Ohio. So are there many descendants of the Parker family that still live in Buxton today? And so this is, this is some of them that you see right here. Hattie Rue Hatchett, so she was the daughter of escaped slaves from Maryland. She became a pianist, teacher, poet, but was not allowed to teach music in the schools and very active in the church. But she wrote the official marching song for the World War I soldiers called The Sacred Spot. 
Anderson Ruffin Abbott. He was educated at the Buxton Mission School, but became the first black Canadian doctor. And he was appointed by President Lincoln as one of eight black surgeons in the Civil War. He was the guest of President Lincoln at a levee at the White House. He became the medical superintendent at Provident Hospital in Chicago. He was the first black coroner in Chatham, and he was president of the Chatham Medical Society and the Chatham Literary and Debating Society. Buxton Traditions. When, when I think of Buxton, Buxton traditions, um, there are so many, but there was such a sense of pride and community that was instilled in everyone when they arrived here, and it's still quite evident today. Um, it's, it's so interesting to see the, the community come together for a variety of activities. So when we did things, we did them as a community, such as square dancing on Friday or going uh, smelting or going down to the lake after church. And family was so, so important um, and still is today. And cooking and music have been vibrant in the community since the founding. Uh, experiences and traditions have been handed down through family and community connection, connections. Um, it's, it's, I guess it's a, a wonderful place to live and we're so fortunate to have so many of our, all of our children and grandchildren that still reside here. But one of the most amazing things um, is our Labor Day homecoming celebration. Um, this next year is going to be our hundredth Excuse me. So in 1923, under this pear tree, which is still standing in my dad's field, um, a church had a baseball game and a picnic. And the following year, they invited some families from Amherstburg. So since then, descendants have been returning home to renew the ties, rekindle the memories and share their heritage with the next generation. So these are just some of the different families that return home every year that are still connected to the fam to the community. Um, and uh, it's just so wonderful to see them coming back because now it's so important for these different generations to know their history, to know their roots and where they're from. So welcome to Buxton. Thank you, Shannon. Um, I had made some notes about the presentations to try to uh, draw out some similarities and some still remaining <clears throat> questions about the varieties of self-liberation we've been hearing about everywhere from Brazil to Suriname to Mexico to Spanish Florida. And uh, I think one of the key elements that we see in common in all of those is the agency of the runaways themselves uh, and that it isn't uh, as portrayed oh often in Anglo-American history as something that had to be assisted or managed by others. So um, I find uh, the different varieties of the marinage that we've heard about very important. And critically, I think the geopolitical knowledge and um, impact that these Maroons had on the governments in which they had to operate. And so if I could ask, uh, the presenters, if they might speak a little bit more about the political engagement of these Maroons and self-liberated people with the governments and how that also creates uh, freedom for them. Maybe I, I can add something. All right, Dunya, please. Um, <laughs> yeah. Really, the, uh, these um, uh, communities of Marons um, uh, in those villages far away from the city, they were remarkable strong in building um, a, a very well working community um, uh, with these grammans, as uh, I showed. Um, you saw two pictures maybe of the Gramans who came to greet uh, the Princess Juliana in 1943 during wartime. Uh, she was crown princess and um, it was uh, greatly celebrated in Suriname. Um, but a special uh, visit of these two Gramans um, was was um, well recorded and um, um, well it shows that they had respect also from 
the, um, the, the authorities. Um, and another thing is that um, in the treaties that were uh, documented, it states that uh, they that the, the communities were permitted to live free, even uh, that some of their um, representatives could uh, go to the city without being afraid of taken um, uh, and, and go back again. Um, which um, also shows that they had their, there was an equilibrium of um, colonial authority and the Maroon communities. But uh, the, the, the thing was that there were many times uh, again and again battles because the plantation owners did not accept that the fugitives run away and that they were not sent back by the Moron communities who welcomed them. So, um, and at the, at, at the end, it's, uh, they, they, sh they showed their power and they defeated these um, uh, military exhibitions which were sent out from the central government in uh, Suriname. Uh, yes, I, 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 there's a wonderful new book that we just had a guest uh, lecture by our, our friend, um, Marie-Hélène Carr's uh, Blood on the River about many of those battles. And um, this is a wonderful example that you also mentioned that their e equivalency and, and power and respect that they achieved through these political engagements. And I see Maria's hand up. So would you like also to jump on that one? Yes, um, actually, I, was, I, I kept getting a pop ups on my screen uh, earlier, so I couldn't answer. But um, so the links or connections between the governments and the uh, individuals. So the way that I have um, understood it based on the records that I have uh, found is that individuals reaching um, freedom destinations or destinations like Mexican spaces in and its broadness that that definition, you know, and how that is defined. Um, what I have seen is that often individuals reaching those spaces were helping craft abolitionist legislation, but also people who were um, black Mexicans uh, as, that had been in Mexico since the colonial periods, which you, you, you um, uh, Dr. Landish know, you know all about, like Mexico <laughs> was the second largest importer of um, during the uh, slave trade of African peoples. Um, so there was a large black population in Mexico, uh, a particularly a free black population in Mexico by the late 18th century, by the 19th century. So the people who were leading, uh, for instance, the movements of our independence in Mexico, there were people of African ancestry who not only were seeking to you know, have a free Mexico, but they really wanted to be free in that new, you know, in that new space or new government or new country. But also what I'm seeing, for instance, when um, we, sh you know, we have discussed the 1789 decree, that was actually prompted by a black woman, woman named Teresa. And Teresa, like that law was prompted because of her resistance and her petitions to the king uh, where the king actually had already um, um, told the governor of the place where she reached, which is Trinidad de Barlovento, which is a, a, a nowadays Trinidad and Tobago, told the governor to return her because they had done a local treaty with the English. And so she was about to be returned, but she was like, no, I need, uh, I, I, and she, you know, she, I need to, that to be reconsidered. And she argued that she was violently treated by her British enslaver. And so the king reconsidered. And of course he didn't issue the law um, by, you know, out of the benevolence of, her, of his heart. It was a political maneuver um, action, but it really, you know, it granted freedom to, to Teresa and it also granted freedom or at least freedom possibilities to early Mexican spaces because the, so the law was signed by in April, 1789. By that summer, the law was already, um, there was a copy of the law in Mexico city. And by that fall, there were copies being sent to the Northern provinces like San Antonio de Bejar and uh, other outposts like Nacogdoches. And so 
you start seeing that while Mexico has this uh, gradual process of abolition, very gradual and slow, you start seeing that the shapers of this freedom, or if we consider Mexican freedom uh, as a thing, it was also crafted by the resistance of people seeking to be free or pushing for this legislation to be passed. Um, and I hope I answered that question. So that's a perfect example. And uh, well, I'd like Rafael to get a chance also to remark on any of the agency of his uh, study. And uh, we've and I think Shannon has been able to get back. So after Rafael, we'll finish hearing from Shannon, and then hope to have enough time to also take uh, questions from our our audience that I see here raising hands as well. So okay. Rafael. Okay. Eu 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 penso o seguinte, que os territórios tradicionais de matriz africana na América, que na historiografia sempre eram considerados como passado, nós estamos diante de um momento histórico particular para transformar essa historiografia oficial conflitante em toda a América e dizer que os quilombos, os territórios tradicionais de matriz africana que sobreviveram, que resistiram, eles são soluções. Eles são soluções na dimensão larga, manutenção da cultura, manutenção dos saberes, saberes também no sentido largo, para curar, saberes para habitar, saberes para alimentação, saberes para é, é, medicina, arquitetura. Então, eu, eu entendo que a América como um todo tem um potencial... De, de conhecimentos que foram guardados por cinco séculos, com resistências, com sofrimentos, mas com muitas sabedorias geopolíticas, porque não é só política, eram geopolíticas. Elas se davam no espaço. E isso hoje está muito disponível. Então, quando eu vejo esse conjunto de apresentações, Jane, desses colegas de várias partes da América, Eu vejo que a América como todo, e esse projeto de Comos é, sim, um, um fio condutor para agregar um novo desenho de que, de um milênio, esse é o milênio dos conflitos culturais e o milênio das soluções culturais também. Então, eu vejo como uma porta concreta um evento como esse para, olha, os territórios tradicionais de matriz africana e dos outros povos tradicionais também, que merecem ter um lugar, ser olhado, ser honrado, é, eles, nesse milênio, podem ser o fio condutor básico de muitas das soluções que estamos buscando. Eu diria isso né, em um evento é, relevante, que eu vejo que o, o, o ponto-chave é agregar pontos comuns. Temos vários pontos comuns em espaços geográficos distintos, mas a perspectiva é a mesma. Um século XXI mais honroso, com mais possibilidade de inserção no sistema. É isso, Jane, passando a That's palavra para você. A wonderful uh, connection to the present and how the local maroon communities across Brazil are engaged in so much political activism as well and making space for their, their communities and finally getting the recognition they deserve. I'm afraid we've gone quite long now because of the technical difficulties. And so Nico's very interesting question about Chinese uh, indentured servants also joining maroon communities is something we can see in other places as well in Cuba, for example. But I think I better turn it over, uh, ask the participants to check the questions and answer those that are coming to them individually, if you will. And I'm turning it over now to Stefan Fresol of ICMOS. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to speak to all of you. Uh, my name is Stefan Fresol and I'm the executive director of ICMOS Canada. Um, well, we're, we're, we're very uh, proud to be uh, partnering on this project with uh, U.S. ICOMOS and other partners across uh, uh, the Americas, particularly because um, as we look, uh, our, our, our countries, each of our, 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 our countries have particular, particular focuses on cultural heritage conservation, and often the stories are shared beyond the borders. And so... We're very excited to, um, to announce to uh, you that uh, US ICOMOS and ICOMOS Canada are preparing a partnership that will be looking at shared 
uh, cultural heritage conservation. And so we're looking particularly at sharing um, uh, resources and, 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 and sharing projects around um, the network to freedom, the Underground Railroad, but also around Indigenous issues uh, related to conservation and so on. So we're very excited uh, to, 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 for the, 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 the upcoming um, year or so where we're going to be working on a, a, a number of projects and, uh, and, and ensuring that we uh, collaborate even more. So thank you very much for this event. It's a pleasure to be, uh, to be uh, on, on board. Hello, my name is Caitlin Packler, and I'm going to share my screen to show you how to get to the website. Um, so if you go to the US ECOMOS website and hover over our work, you can click on under the International Underground Railroad uh, link here and it'll pop up. Um, and what you can see is the work that U.S. ECOMOS has done in collaboration with other national committees of ECOMOS worldwide, um, including our presentation tonight, some other news and events that are coming up in the future. And also you can see some of our resources like last year, um, Winnie, I think she's in the audience, created a story map on different places uh, based on last year's partnerships. And this year, another one of our volunteers um, worked on a bibliography. And with that, we're going to turn it over to Emmy. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, yes, my name is Emmy, and I'm a project volunteer. I am also going to share my screen. Give me one second. We should be good to go now. There we go. Uh, so as part of this project, um, we have created a bibliography of accessible resources on the subject of international self-liberation. The full bibliography can be found on the International Underground Railroad project page on the US ICMOS website. Now, the bibliography contains primary and secondary sources and uses contemporary geopolitical borders as its primary categorization method. We acknowledge, however, that geopolitical borders have changed over time. And because of this, the current categorizations may or may not be the ones that were present at the time of the historical period discussed in these categorized sources. Uh, importantly, this bibliography is collaborative. Uh, we need your help to ensure its growth. Uh, we invite you to submit resources about the history of the universal desire for self-liberation from slavery for inclusion in this bibliography. You can do this on the International Underground Railroad project page on the US ICOMOS website. Thank you very much. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, um, for uh, joining our webinar. Thank you to everyone. Um, as you can see, we've had, uh, um, uh, we have a whole bunch of things that we've been, we've been working on in collaboration around the world. Um, and so please do submit to our story map if you know of any more stories of self-liberation um, or if you know of any sort resources, please do submit to our bibliography. Um, we have lots of other important, um, we're, we're moving forward with lots of different projects. Um, and uh, on that note, I leave it up to uh, our president, uh, Doug Comer, to finish her off, but to finish us off. But thank you very much to, for joining us, and do you know stay and in, uh, get involved and uh, um, keep an eye out for for new things happening uh, on the on the project. Well, that was exceptional. I really enjoyed uh, all the presentations. Just learned a lot. And what a great. Uh, collaboration we're putting together. I want to thank all the remarkable presenters. And this should be the beginning, it's a line from a movie that I think is appropriate. This should be the beginning of a beautiful friendship. <laughs> <laughs> also, an opportunity to bring the stories of self-liberation from a lot of different places to, I think, what could be an enormous public audience. I'd like to mention that recordings of this will be available in a few days at our on our US ECOMOS website, and I encourage you to visit that website. And also, while you are there, um, if you'd like to become a member, that would be wonderful. We depend upon our membership to support our work. And I, there will be many opportunities for members to participate in our programs and activities in the coming months. We have a lot, a lot planned. 
For example, this is the first of a series of webinars that we will hold on the International Underground Railroad Network to Freedom. We will be posting information about this on our website. We will, as you've just heard, be working on other intriguing projects with our international partners, including the story maps, which are really very interesting and engaging with places and stories associated with self-liberation and also providing access and amassing this, act, this literature, providing access to literature that's relevant to these issues. And finally, I want to thank you all for attending. Really, if you'd like to become involved with the International Underground Railroad Network of Freedom, please do not hesitate to let us know. And we would be particularly uh, happy, uh, delighted to involve emerging professionals, our young people who will be carrying the torch throughout the decades ahead. So until we meet again, please stay safe and well. It's been a great pleasure to hear it from you. And thank you again for attending. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, Doug.